to another episode of the Stuck in My Mind podcast. I am your host, W-I-Z-E. My next guest is the acclaimed author of the five-day job search. Welcome to the show, Annie Margarita Yang. Hello. Well, hi, Will. Thanks for having me on today. The pleasure's all mine. How are you doing today? Quite wonderful. All right. So let's just let's jump into this. So what what inspired you to to how did you become the go-to authority in, in, in millennial finance? Well, that's a self pro- self proclamation okay. right there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, nobody. I'll be very honest though. Whenever you write anything for marketing, nobody just wakes up and says, "Hey, you're so good at what you do. I want to give you an award and make you king of the world." Right? <laughs> you kind of have to call yourself that first before yeah. anyone considers you as that. So, when I was 20, I decided you know what, I don't care the fact that I'm working a minimum wage job. I want to help other people with their finances because I was making, what, $8 an hour, but I was still able to save 25 to 50% of my income without ever asking my parents for money. And I was like, I don't understand how people could make more than me, but they're broke and living paycheck to paycheck. So I'm just going to help people with their finances because it's something I was gifted gifted at from um with the help of God, right? It comes to me naturally and other people struggle with it. So I want to help them with it. Okay. So can can you share a brief overview of your book, the five day job search and its core principles? Yeah. A brief overview is it basically starts off with the story of how after I graduated from college with a degree in communications, I was working at Domino's pizza for $8 an hour. I worked a whole string of part-time jobs on minimum wage. And then when my husband and I, we moved to Boston, I was like, you know, we have a new life here. And because I'm so good at managing our money for our household, why don't I just do this for a business? I mean, it's just the same thing, but on a larger scale. So I started applying to accounting jobs, despite people telling me that I was unqualified and I didn't have the formal qualifications for this. So I applied to 50 a day. And then at the end of seven days, I got an offer. Now, I thought that was just luck. But then in my second job search, I got an offer in only six days. And then in my third job search a year after that, I got an offer in only five days. So if you can do it three times in a row, you know, I think at that point, it's skill. I'm on to something here. And the five day job search book is basically all the secrets on how I managed to do it. So so what so what inspired you to write the book specifically tailored for for young professionals? Oh my gosh, you know, the reason is because I am just really sick and tired of teachers and well-meaning guidance counselors telling young people who are still in high school that in order to be really successful and have um a great career, you need to take on all the student loan debt. You know, it, it, it's this kind of like prevailing philosophy or mentality that The more money you borrow in student loan debt, let's say you get a marketing degree and $80,000 in student loan debt. I saw a TikTok short on that. (laughs) Um, They think that like the more student loan debt you take on, then maybe that means you'll be more competitive in the job market coming out. And that's not necessarily the case. And people are graduating without the skills necessary to get even an entry level job in their field. So that's why it's targeted for young professionals, because I feel like um adults well-meaning adults are really doing 18 year olds a huge disservice now it's it i posted something earlier where i posted uh, um something on facebook where they talked about these are the things you should be teaching in schools and one was banking investing all these different things that aren't taught in schools like self-development all like balancing like Kids don't even know how to balance a checkbook right now. Yeah, they don't. They, I, but to be fair, though, even I think people over 40 don't know how to do it either. Because if you check the stats, you know, the vast majority of Americans don't even have $500 to their name. So they're basically just one check away from homelessness, basically. So uh, it, it'd be a... I don't necessarily agree with teaching it in school because it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. The blind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I would think if you're going to, if you are going to teach it, you're going to have to have people. When I, 
you can have people who actually have done it teach it. But yeah. but where? You know, have you ever so, thought about that? Like, how is that going to work? If if a finance professional or someone who's really good with money, if I was making why, like, wanted, why would he want to take the pay of a teacher? Yeah. Why would I want to take the pay of a teacher <laughs> if I can earn six figures doing something a, a lot more lucrative? Right. You know? Is, yeah. So that's where people like you come along, right? Yes. So while I don't like necessarily go teach at a school, I want to be where the young people are. So basically for 2024, I'll be focusing a lot more on TikTok. I've been growing my my following only solely through YouTube, but I see that a lot more of Gen Z, they're on TikTok instead. So I want to go to where those people are to get my message across. They're not, I, I feel like even if we taught it in school because of the kind of disrespect that they have for adults, that kind of like, it's cool to be rebellious and not to listen to adults kind of like culture. Um, even if you taught the information, they might not be open to what you have to say. But if it's on a cool platform like TikTok, they might be like, ah, you know, she makes sense. She could be like my big sister or something like that. So how does your approach to financial planning differ from traditional advice? Well, I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm not going to take somebody's um, portfolio and then take a 1% fee. This is not how I work. Basically, I'm more of someone who just gives away the information on mass. I also don't do private coaching for anyone. People would come to me asking me to help them make budgets. And I found that like, honestly, the best thing is if I gave people the advice on mass and they just took what was necessary for their own situation and then they can just discard the rest. Really, I think um, the best is like God helps those who help themselves. And that kind of philosophy also applies in this case. So okay, so with with you, with you, obviously, like you said you're not a financial advisor. So, so how can millennials strike up a balance between paying off student loan debts and saving for the future? They have to have a really targeted plan. It's, I I feel like whatever people are doing, they're not really focused. So I'm not sure if you've heard of Dave Ramsey. But he yes, is really popular, you know, and he talks about like gazelle intensity, right? And, you know, he has that seven step plan. First, fund your emergency fund with a thousand bucks. And then after that, don't fund it anymore. Pay off all your debts. Then after you pay off all your debts, fully fund your emergency fund with six months to a year's worth of expenses. And then after that, you can invest and save for your future. And I feel like this this kind of like baby step thing, while I don't necessarily agree with all of his advice, the gazelle intensity of like focusing on one thing and only that one thing until you hit that target and before you move on to the next you can use the same thing um when helping millennials pay off their student loan debt or saving money right you can start with that one thousand dollars i think these days with inflation it should be adjusted for two thousand dollars <laughs> as an emergency fund and then after that you go all in in paying off that student loan debt so in my book the five-day job search i talk about how i went from the second job to the third job, I went from making $45,000 to $80,000. Now, that's a $35,000 pay increase, right? Like if you have no lifestyle inflation whatsoever and you continue to live and act as if you never made that much more money and you just kept living on your old income, right? You can use that difference to pay off your student loan debt. Like if the average person, which is kind of true, like the average person these days coming out of college, they owe thirty six grand. Can you imagine, like, if you got a pay increase from 45K to 80K, then you can literally pay off your student loan debt in just a year and a half. And then you can move on with your life. It doesn't have to be something that takes 21 years to pay off. The average person takes 21 years to pay it off. So with with them still living as if they were making $45,000 instead of living as, living, because they're now they're making $85,000 a year, right? So instead of acting like you're making 85 now still live as if you're making 45 do the same things you were doing when you was making 45,000 and the rest of that money that you're making use it to pay off your student loan exactly that's a great summary and in fact and, and for anyone out there complaining like well I I didn't even start at 45 I started at 25 or 30 um I I just want to say like if you went to college then think back to the times when you were in college you lived like you were totally broke, 
right? Um, or maybe you lived at home with mom and dad. So if you don't even make 45, then you can go even lower than that and live with your parents and go gung ho. Mm -hmm. Gazelle intensity at paying off that student loan debt. I don't, I don't think parents. I don't think parents want to hear that. I don't think parents. I, know, I, I don't think parents want to hear that. But I mean, if you just did it for one year, two years, and you paid your parents rent you know, live with your parents, but pay them a discounted rent or something like that. That could be a potential option for me personally, because I got married at um, 21 years old. I moved right in with my husband. So, you know, it's almost like having a roommate. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So hold on one second. So what, what role does mindset play in achieving financial success, especially for, for millennials because we know they're yeah they're, they're all over the place what, that, what, what it plays the biggest role because you know what i think millennials but maybe this also applies to all generations they have this mindset that it's impossible to get ahead and they they genuinely <laughs> believe that the american dream is dead that oh life was so easy for the baby boomers they had it made and then they deliberately made it difficult for us financially. But if you really look back in history, like going, let's go back 2000 years, it's the same song and dance. Every generation has had financial inequality problems. And it's always been that small handful of each generation that somehow are able to go from having absolutely nothing to having made something of themselves. That's always been the case, regardless of which country you're in um, and what time period as well. Right. So it's really up to you to correct this mindset. The American dream is still alive and well. That's what I believe. And I think Americans need to take that into account. And, and listen, and now more than ever, with the way um, you can do stuff remotely, you can do stuff digitally. There is so much opportunity right now in 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 in, 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 in what we're doing, especially now, because I'm sure you're off your <clears throat> With everything, it, is it easier for you now with the way everything is digital? Or do you still do you still feel you need to be more intimate in a more intimate setting to do what you're doing? No, I think, well, it really depends on your line of work. You know, like I, my neighbor is a social worker and um, we both live in a condo building. So I work with him in terms of like managing the condo building. And then I was like, hey, let me show you the financials. I sent you an email. Can you open it on your computer? And he was kind of just like, what computer? I don't own a computer. <laughs> I do everything on my phone. I was like, you're 43 years old. How do you not live without a computer in this day and age? Um, well, a lot so of people it, live, it, live it off their on, phone. It depends on like your line of work, right? He's in social work. He works with like troubled teenagers. So he doesn't really need to use the computer. Yeah, he, 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 your your phone is a computer. Your, your phone is. It's not like he's doing what I'm doing, where I need uh, a desktop. And even though, even though to do a podcast, I'm, you don't necessarily need a computer. You can, you can still do it on your phone. But it, it, it's it's yeah. Some people aren't into the digital age, but something with with what like what you're doing. It's. I would think it would be much easier to for it to, to translate into a digital age, whereas like social work is more intimate. Yeah, I think so. Definitely for office work, administrative work, any sort of that kind of stuff, it's easier than ever before to be able to work from home with just your computer. And then I feel like um, because marketing. Right. A lot of marketing these days is social media marketing and that kind of work can be done remotely. And the the cost, the barrier of entry into this field is so low. Right. Literally, all you need is a computer and connection to Internet. You can take courses on Udemy.com for twelve dollars and ninety nine cents and learn about marketing. And then you can also learn from trial and error as well. So I feel like there's just so much. Um, there's like this abundance of opportunity that people cannot see it. So for with me, um, when the pandemic hit in 2020, when it came here and hit 2020 and we, I was furloughed from my job and everything, I took, to, I took courses on Udemy. I took um, courses on Allison, even Google office, cor office courses. And, and I started 
certifying myself in certain things. Like I took editing courses. I got certified as a life coach. There's different things that I did. I took the time to, to really invest in, the, invest in these things. Cause that's what it is. That's what it, some, <clears throat> that's what stops people. A lot of the time is they don't want to waste, spend the time in, in wanting to develop and grow. They want instant gratification. They want instant now. And instead of, taking the courses and learning things in order for you to, to really grow and develop it, that that's, that's the situation a lot of people face now. Yeah, I think so. And I like what you said there about taking courses and delaying the gratification because people have called me lucky. I'll be very honest. I, I get a little offended by that, <laughs> even though I don't show it publicly, but every time someone like, says, oh, well, you got to where you are because of pure luck or like you just happened to be at the right time, at the right place, you know, and, and met the right person. And this was like a common um, criticism of my book from reviewers, scathing reviewers, very jealous of the way my life has turned out. And I have to say, I mean, like, but I've spent like the last 10 years, right, an hour per day improving myself. Mm-hmm. I spent like an hour per day that I wasn't paid for and I had to spend my own money to improve myself, to, uh, to read books from the library, to take courses from Udemy, watch YouTube videos, right? Whatever I could get my hands on, I intentionally always spent one hour per day working on something that could be improved, whether that was learning how to edit videos or learning how to edit audio, learning how to make the production value look a lot better, right? Mm -hmm. So many different things that nobody paid me to do and nobody told me I had to do. I just had to do it on my own volition. And 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 that's, that's, that's the same thing with me is, um, the only way I improved in what I was doing as far as my podcast, my audio, my video was me taking time, spending hours on YouTube, spending time on, on other courses that I've taken because, Again, I wanted to improve. It's like you just don't go and you're not gonna know everything. You're not just gonna jump in. I, I've had to learn a lot of different things. I didn't know anyone who was podcasting. So I had to learn how to be a podcaster. I had to connect with other people, build relationships, learn, ask questions. And and, and eventually things started falling in place. But it took me wanting to learn. I I didn't come in thinking that, oh, I'm gonna just jump in and it's going to, my side, my podcast is going to be successful. No, I had to come in, grind, learn how to do thumbnails, how to fill out descriptions, how to optimize the SEOs, all these different things that I didn't have a clue. They know any of that, but I felt that was going to help me improve. That was going to help me make, make me a better podcaster. So I invested the time in, in doing it. I think you did a great job because looking at your setup right now, you've got everything going for you. You've got a really nice mic, the headphones and all. And you you even positioned your mouth at the right distance from the mic because I watch other podcast hosts. They make that mistake. They they sit too far from the microphone and that's that doesn't help them with their audio quality. So you, you got it all down pat. That's one thing I learned. One of the first things I learned was the difference between a condenser mic and a dynamic mic. Like a condenser mic picks up more sound everywhere, whereas I'm using a dynamic mic right here, and I have to have it. I have to have my position, my mouth positioned right in a nice spot, like That's like right. at least at least this distance. You don't have, you don't have to be up on top of it. <laughs> you just sit sit back, sit nice, set it up where you want it, and and it projects perfectly for me. But it again, it was me doing the research, me learning about the different mics, me wanting to make sure like all right this is the kind of mic i need i don't need this mic because i'm not working in this area, this type of space the space that i'm working in is perfect for what i need you still there yeah i'm here okay <laughs> all right so let's see um what what are what are some tips for negotiating a, a better salary or promotion Cause that's something that um, a lot of people don't really know how to do. Yeah. I think a lot of people, they pull the numbers out of their butt. Like, Hey, 
I need a an increase. I need ten thousand dollars more because I've been at this company for two years at this point, you know, or like I need this much more because of inflation or because my financial situation has changed and I owe extra money on this bill or something like that. Um, they come up with like all sorts of reasons why they need better pay. But I think the best way to negotiate for a better pay is to actually research the market value of what you do, of your title, basically. Like, it's almost like if you go into a seafood restaurant, right, and you look at some of the items on the menu, let's say they had um, a whole fresh fish, a bronzino fish, and it always says market price. There's no set price on the actual menu. You have to ask the server, how much is it for today? Okay, today's price is $35. Tomorrow's price is not the same. The same thing works when you apply for a job or when you're asking for a raise because this is why it's called a job market. It's supply and demand. There's a buy and then there's a sell. And if you don't know what the range is for today's market, then you're not going to negotiate well. So what I recommend people do is to actually go on Google and type in the job title. So let's say right now I'm in a I'm a real estate accounting manager, right? You type that into Google, real estate accounting manager salary, Boston MA. And then you open up all of the different um, links into a new tab. Let's say there's salary.com, indeed.com, payscale.com, glassdoor.com that gives you salary figures. Now, which one do you trust? See, because there's a wide range and you don't want to use the wrong source. So what I do is I actually open every single one of them and then I copy and paste the lows from each of them into an Excel sheet, then the medians and then the highs. And then I average all the lows, I average all the medians, and then I average all of the highs. That way I have reasonable numbers to work with. And there's no like outliers that are skewing these, these numbers to either extreme. Then you can take this, you go back to your employer, um, and you say, hey, uh, I, I've been doing this for, I don't know, 10 years. I am I should actually be paid on the high end of this range here, right? Like if, if the range is, let's say, 70000 to 110000 I'm really experienced. You hardly need to ever tell me how to do my job. In fact, I'm the one consulting you on how to solve problems because I've been doing this for 10 years. I should actually be cl paid closer to 110000 not the 70000 that I'm at from before. So I think that's a better way to, to negotiate a raise, honestly. Yeah, it, it, it would make more sense for you to go in with, with actual st statistics to, to prove your point to be like, listen, this is what the average, whatever position you're in is making. And this is what my experience dictates and what no, the issues you don't have no issues with them and it would make sense for you to come with with those numbers yeah that's right and i think people honestly people have always told you told me in the past to research what the salary should be but because i always had like outliers i was like should i trust this outlier number now that i know to average the lows average the medians average the highs and now i'm sharing this with other people i think people can negotiate with more confidence <laughs> Because honestly, I wouldn't have had the confidence before because I wouldn't know if the numbers could be trusted. Okay. So, so this is this, we do talk about mental health and all this on the show and everything. Can you can you share insights on the relationship between personal finances and mental health? Oh my goodness, Will! <laughs> this this is internet like so intimately connected because. If you don't have, well, hello. I'm here. I'm still here. Oh. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> That's something happened to your camera. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, I feel like if you live paycheck to paycheck and you're broke all the time and it's like stressing you out, it can cause you to go like crazy. You know, I feel like back when I wasn't earning really much and I had to work like I don't know seven days a week just to make ends meet, working five part time jobs at any given time and then like even in a given day i had to go to three different part-time jobs it drove me crazy and after doing that for a whole year i'll be very honest i was depressed 
<laughs> you know, I was like, when is this going to end? I feel like I'm, I'm always spinning my wheels. And if you don't get mental health, like help, then you might spiral. I think they are intimately connected. Yeah, there, there is definitely something that, that um, is very, it's what causes a lot of problems within even marriages and stuff is, is finances is learning how to manage if, if, part if the both if both parties in the, in the relationship aren't on the same page it can definitely put a strain on that relationship and and put a strain on your mental health as well yeah definitely and that's why you know i i really like to think of my great grandfather so i haven't shared this story very much with most people um but my parents they actually they're from china and before the communists took over and just sucked the wealth out of the country, out of private citizens, and took their real estate away, took their businesses away. Um, my great grandfather actually owned 26 pharmacies, both in China and in like Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam. Like it was just a really wealthy man and owned a lot of real estate as well. But then the Chinese government took everything away. And um, when he tried to escape China into Hong Kong, the border patrol asked for a bribe and he didn't have the money. And he's like, if you just let me through to the other side, I could access my other bank accounts in Vietnam and Malaysia. I'll give you the money after I'm out. But they wouldn't help him. So um, he had to turn around and go back to his hometown. And then, you know, instead of like being strong about it and going like, you know, it's just money. You can earn it again. You can make do. Uh, he ended up committing suicide because he lost everything. Right. And I just want like people to know, yes, life is difficult when you don't have money, but I mean, why, you know, money is that's the question, just... no, that's, the question. that's the question. A lot of people ask, like, we, we don't know what, what people, what, what is going through people's minds when, when they commit suicide. It's, um, especially now, like suicide rates is at a, at a high rate and, and, especially at, during the pandemic and and different there's different it's it's it's, it's crazy that that it, it's something that isn't really tackled here in this country it's like oh they 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 look at it as something that they're not looking at it as as the, as a problem like they're just like oh people just come they're not really focusing on how can we stop these things like especially um we have veterans that come here that are come back from whatever, where, wherever they serve and everything. And they're committing suicide at an all time high. Like I had a veteran on the other day and he talked about that. It, just, it says 22, 22 veterans hmm. com, um, commit suicide a day. And he said, that actually the number is skewed because there's there it's more like 40 because some of them aren't, aren't leaving notes or so then they're not able to identify these people or, or whatever it is and 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 so we, we it's fine it, there's so many different reasons why like with your grandfather it, it was it was I'm, i could imagine having everything you worked so hard and and it's just taken away from you um, there's people here that have, they've lost their jobs and and that was very important to them and, and and they ended up taking so it's difficult to I know but I just want to say it is possible to build back up oh, yes of like course once it is someone hits rock bottom and they have the mental health issues it, it doesn't have to be a permanent state like you can build from there I mean the beauty of hitting a rock bottom you know, and and hitting that is there's nowhere left to go but up, yeah, and you become I, stronger for it as well. Oh, I I agree with you. I I agree. Yeah. I believe me. I am one. I'm someone who's who's hit rock bottom, who's experienced great loss, and 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 would it would probably been easy for me to give up and and and, and hurt myself. I, I was. When when I suffered the loss that I suffered, I, I was in a bad place, but I was able to to 
seek the help that I needed, turn my life around and get back on my feet. And and sometimes I feel as if I'm, I'm not a religious person. I am a spiritual person. And I do believe that God doesn't put me in situations that he doesn't think I can handle. So he knew I was capable, that I was strong enough to face the adversities that he put before me. And not everyone is capable of that. There's some people who who struggle with that. And 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 yes, it, it hurts. You would you you want to help as many people as possible get through this and, and overcome these struggles. But for some people, life is really hard. For some people, they're not strong enough to deal with these circumstances. And it's it's sad to see the outcome. Yeah. But you know what? I think the people who do make it and rise above, like you, you came up from the bottom. I feel like you're spreading your light. That, and, that's but, the amazing thing. But that you had, I had to go through what I had to go through in order for me to be able to shine now. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it go like someone asked me if if I regret any other stuff that happened to me in my life, and my answer was. I don't wish it upon anyone, but it happened and it made me who I am today. It has it, made me come out and, and do my show and make an impact on people's lives who have struggled, who have gone through tragedies, who's, who's gone to be able to come out and share my story and have, have a platform where people can come and share their story and talk about struggles and, and, and overcoming those odds and turning their life around and trying to help people. Like it's, it's important that you're out here wanting to teach these, the millennials and, and everyone else how to, to, to manage their finances, how to turn it's, those are, those are things that are very important because again, if some, a lot of people who, who struggle with a lot of debt, don't know, just get overwhelmed and, and, and drown within this debt. And, to be able to to provide a platform where someone like you can come on and discuss these these issues and and talk about how they can change their life around by taking different steps and 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 learning what to do with with their finances and cuz like again I feel like everyone now it's instant grat. They want instant gratification. They they don't want to to work hard and and they don't want to see that with you putting in the effort and and working hard and and growing in self development and, and like you said, you put in. You've been the last ten years. You've been putting work into yourself, right? Yeah, that's right. And all the people who see are the success that you're you're, you're reaping from now, but they didn't see you they doing the ten, 10 years. years ago. They didn't see you with the ten years of struggling. And they that's didn't what see it is. me. Yeah, they, they they didn't see me in in the years when I remember working at the grocery store. The Jewish those Jewish mothers coming to the express lane checkout, you know, going like, "Why aren't you in college?" You know, like, and then insulting me for not having gone to college. They haven't seen things like that they haven't seen me literally cut my finger slicing deli meats you know they haven't seen things uh, all the crazy things that have happened to me um if they had known all the bad things that have happened to me they wouldn't have wished to have the life that i have had and that's and that's what that's with a lot of people like again it's 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 a testament of you continuously continuing on your path and 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 overcoming the struggles that you've overcome to to be where you're at now it, it's it's just show it, that's why coming on and and doing podcasts and and, and talking to people like yourself and it, it's to show people that hey listen wherever you come from whatever walk of life you come from you can turn your life around and that's the message of the of of the show this is what i want regardless of what your background or is right now what are you doing right now it doesn't matter it's it's being able to share your story and people see that man 
they they came from nothing. They they experienced so much. They to be able to see other people, other people struggle and and overcome it, is what is what's most important to me. And that's the most beautiful thing, actually, because nobody cares about the person who was born with a silver spoon in their mouth. I mean, what what good is a story of like somebody who was born to a really good family not, with not, that middle class? Born like, yeah, because you know, and then but, went went straight to college and then got a good paying job after. It's not like this amazing dramatic story that inspires not, that, people. But that's not everyone's story. Everyone yeah. goes through struggle. Everyone goes through through harsh life. Life is ups and downs, man. It, I you, agree. You, you go agree. through ups and downs in life. It's how you bounce back from the down. I have I have found that even for I have wealthy clients because I do accounting. So I, I have a good intimate look at their finances. They kind of see what they spend their money on. You can know what's going on in their life as well, right? And then I see like some people have children that like struggle with um I don't know, depression, anxiety, or something, despite having all the money that they could ever ask for. Because money, and money isn't like, a solution. Because, money's because not money is not a solution, right? Yeah. We always think that, like, somebody who had a good life, you know, has the money. They must not have any problems. But I've come to realize that money cannot solve, let's say, for example, if you're having marital problems, yes, the number one cause of money fights is finances. But that's not... The cause of all fights it could be miscommunication mm. issues it could be a values mismatch who knows what it is um money doesn't solve that problem right you can use money to to look for the solution to find a therapist or whatever resources you need to solve the problem but ultimately the ability to solve the problem is in your character yeah. it's the same thing same thing if you have like a mental health issue like you know that child that i know about they they spend thousands i swear tens of thousands of dollars on different forms of therapy to help their daughter um she still has problems even with all this money and this help so in the end she she needs to figure out what what is the solution for her problem regardless of money or not you know the money is something that can solve problems of convenience because you've seen listen there's, there's just look at some of the celebrities in the past who who've taken their own life even being successful and having all this money it, it, it's not it's it's trying to find out what's the issue within the like money is not gonna help the situation it it, it makes life easier for certain definitely certain, just easier it makes yeah. life easier but it's not the solution it's not what's gonna make you happy you have to find that within yourself you have to find that within what is it that makes me happy? What is it that, and and I feel like a lot of people don't don't find that they don't understand like what is it that brings you joy? Like being able, like being able to find my purpose and and live a purposeful life and live a life where, man, this is what I love. To, I love doing my podcast because I love to make an impact. I, I, my goal is to impact people's lives. And that's why I do my podcast is to be able to share these messages is, is to be able to show people that, Hey, regardless of where you come from, regardless of what you've experienced, things can look up, things can change for you. It, it, it's, it's all into how you go attack it or however you bounce back from whatever the tragedies that you're going through. And it's it's not easy. It's definitely not easy, but it can be done. And some, for me, when I was going through my struggles, I knew I need to I need to go sit down and speak to someone, and 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 find a solution that way. And and that's what's been able to help me turn my life around. Yeah, I I think the the thing is though. The great thing you did is you sought help. Yeah. Right. Some people, um, like there are people I have known who I try to help, but unless they're ready to get the help, they don't take it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I have so many people I know that I have gone out of my way to offer help, but they don't want it. I think some people need to learn from their own mistakes before they ask for help. So, yeah.
they definitely have to um be receptive to the help they did if is if if they don't want to choose you can't force anyone like is that like that saying you can bring the horse to the water but you can't force them to drink it that's right, right. so but um Annie, thank you so much for being a guest. Now you get the part, it's now where you get the solo screen and you get to plug away and let everybody know where exactly they can find you, where they can get the book, everything. The best way to find me is on www.annieyangfinancial.com. That's A N N I E Y A N G financial.com. And also, if you want, you can get the five day job search audiobook for free. It's also on annieyangfinancial.com. At the top of the homepage, just click on audiobook, put in your name, your email address, and you can download the five hour book. And you also you have a YouTube channel, don't you? That's right. I have a YouTube channel. You can follow me on YouTube, though I've been getting censored and shadow banned these days despite having an 18,000 subscriber following. <laughs> YouTube <laughs> has not been pushing out my videos to even my own subscriber base. So that's why I recommend you head over to Annie Yang Financial and get on my mailing list to stay in touch. Yes, and that's that's something that's very important. Um, that's something I, I I tell a lot of podcasters is to build a, a email subscription, build a, get collect emails and send a. These are things that I've learned that I've I've learned in the past, but I started actually implementing this year, this past year, and it's 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 um re, it's helped my podcast grow. Being able to send a weekly uh, weekly newsletter, the newsletter, and just automating a lot of different things. So it's it's important that you do build your your email list. It's um, and 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 that way, like again, you can have direct impact to your clients and to and to your and for me as far as for me as my audience. Yeah. But thank you so much. This has been great. I appreciate you being the guest. Thanks for having me on tonight. But uh, don't leave just yet. Let me uh, close out the show. I mean, you can chat a little bit off air. But uh, thank you. All right. All right. Uh, shout out to everybody who's in the chat. Drew Willingham, Facebook user. I don't know who you are, but thank you for coming through. Shout out to everybody on on uh, Instagram. Because I've been using Instagram the last three days now that... Um, StreamYard allows us to stream to Instagram. So I'm excited about that. That's a whole different audience. Shout out to the Real Wise fan, Poppy J, Brandy J. Love you guys. Shout out to the boss lady. Appreciate you and love you. And as always, a big, big shout out to all the essential workers out there. God bless you. Be safe. You know, your boy, Wise does it. Peace out. Mm -hmm.